Hello and welcome everyone to the Active Inference Lab. Today it is January 10th, 2022, and we're here in ActInf guest stream number 14 with a whole host of awesome guests. We're going to be discussing osteopathy and mental health, and we're going to have the authors say hello and introduce themselves. Then Lucas will give a presentation. And during the presentation, please feel free to add your comments and questions in the live chat. And then we'll have a bunch of time after the presentation to ask those questions to the authors, hear any author's remarks. So really excited to hear from you all and learn from your perspective. Let's hear the introductions from the authors and then go to Lucas. So please, Robert, and then we'll kick it off from there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Robert Shaw. I'm based in Sweden. I'm an osteopath and a psychotherapist. My research interest is particularly with embodiment, um, and that was what my PhD was on, embodiment within the therapeutic relationship. Hi, everyone. I'm Francesco uh, Ceritelli uh, from Italy. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist and an osteopath. Uh, mainly um, interest in uh, discovering the uh, how the brain uh, works uh, in relation to touch in relation to the effect of touch uh, uh, based on the different uh, type of um, stimuli uh, that the uh, the body received. Hi, uh, I'm George Estevez. I'm an osteopath. I'm currently based in Malta and Italy. Uh, I'm also a cognitive scientist, and my main interest is on predictive processing, active inference, uh, touch, and chronic pain in general. Yeah, hi. My name is uh, Lukas. I think I'm the last of the authors. So I'm an osteopath as well, based in, in Hamburg in Germany, and I'm uh, currently working part-time at the Osteopathic Research Institute and uh, I'm working there in education, education and research and I'm also part-time studying psychology and neuroscience at mental, uh, of mental health at uh, King's College in London and um, I think I can kick off the presentation now if that's okay with you Daniel. Perfect, thanks. So um, yeah, we have uh, the opportunity. Thanks again for the Active Inference Lab for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we have the opportunity to present a paper that we have recently uh, published in Frontiers in Psychology in the section Health Psychology, the research topic uh, called An Activism and Active Inference in the Therapeutic Alliance. And uh, the paper is entitled Osteopathy and Mental Health and uh, Embodied Predictive and Interoceptive Framework. And um, yeah, without further ado, I think let's let's dive right into it. Um, a little introduction on, on why these things might be interesting. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, globally a very high prevalence and a burden, but also comorbidity between musculoskeletal and uh, mental health disorders. So to put this in perspective, about uh, 1 billion prevalent cases of mental disorders have been reported in uh, 2017, while about 1.3 billion prevalent cases have been reported of musculoskeletal disorders in 2017. So together, these uh, two broad spectrum of disorders are um, very prevalent, but also burdensome. So um, together, both, both conditions uh, contribute um, to work, are the main contributors to, to work by disability. But um, musculoskeletal mental disorders are also highly comorbid, uh, which means, for example, that anxiety, depression are frequently co occur with uh, chronic and often musculoskeletal pain conditions and vice versa. So, um, for example, depressive symptoms are quite uh, prevalent in uh, pain sufferers and pain symptoms are also quite prevalent in individuals with depression. Um, so, these, uh, this data kind of outlines in a need to, to integrate physical and mental healthcare services in our opinion, but also in the opinion of many research papers uh, in the literature. So, um, especially multidisciplinary collaborations between musculoskeletal and psychological healthcare specialists uh, have been called for. Um, but on the other hand, there have also been some disease classifications that have been proposed uh, to, to combine physical and mental health 
um, and propose classifications that are neither purely somatic nor, nor purely mental. So uh, we believe that there is, is a need to integrate uh, these kind of, uh, of approaches. And uh, we like to propose osteopathy to be, to be one of these approaches. And um, osteopathy, for those who don't know, is, is generally used primarily to treat musculoskeletal disorders like back pain. But um, it is also uh, has recently been proposed to benefit psychosocial factors, in particular in, 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 uh, in patient populations with persistent pain. And um, there have also there was also some research that have, has been conducted from Hilary Abbey and, and colleagues showing uh, some positive outcomes um, of combined treatment as a, com as a combined osteopathy and combined uh, psychological informed strategies uh, showing positive results. So there are only a few attempts to, to investigate the effectiveness of osteopathy in, in the field of mental health and there are only a few approaches being uh, developed to, to treat or to engage with mental health. So uh, based on, on this background, we proposed, um, we, we tried to propose a framework on how to move forward and how to research the putative effects of osteopathy in this field. And uh, we do so by drawing together um, from the research fields of uh, embodied cognition, predictive coding, but also interoception and osteopathy. And we like to propose uh, in the end our framework, which is an embodied predictive and interoceptive framework. And if you look on the right hand side, figure one, this is kind of our, our background uh, put together and to simplify body cognition kind of highlights uh, the role of the body in cognition and in mental health. And um, these processes are, processes are likely underpinned by predictive coding uh, processes. So um, furthermore, our access point, uh, we discuss interoception as, as an access point and therapeutic access point to, to uh, affect these processes and we argue that osteopathy might might be an approach to to realize this aim so let's have a look at the uh, background we start with the first research field which is uh, embodied cognition and um, generally embodied embodiment is an interdisciplinary field of research which spans disciplines uh, including philosophy but also psychology psychiatry and uh, neuroscience and in general, these theories of embodiment argue that the cognition and emotion are both uh, dependent on embedded, uh, embodied simulations. So they argue that body and mind are inseparable in producing cognition and that uh, the non-neural body uh, might both constrain and enable cognition. But notably, there are stronger and weaker versions of embodiment. Um, some argue that the body uh, might contribute to uh, cognitive processes, while uh, uh, other versions argue that it might constitute cognitive processes. Um, so, to uh, get a little more, bit more detail involved, uh, theories of embodiment argue that cognition and emotion are based upon uh, reinstatements of perception. So, this is relating to both external, extraceptive, and, and internal, meaning interoceptive sensory states, but also to action, which relates to proprioceptive motor states. And these perceptions produce embodied or sensory motor simulations, which uh, of previous experiences in one's self. So this is a, a kind of explanation of embodiment. And um, this perspective is quite interesting because it, it might revise our brain-centered uh, view of cognition by acknowledging that uh, these processes are not simply limited to neural events uh, in the brain, but also cut across the brain, body, and world divisions and should be also studied accordingly. And there are different kinds of commitment to the embodied uh, uh, theories. And, and, and activism is an interesting uh, aspect or linked concept that I want to, to go into detail a little bit further. And, and activism proposes that cognition uh, emerges from the dynamic interaction of um, brain, body, and also environment. So, um, most of you might have heard about the 4E cognition, um, which is that cognition is uh, all together embodied, embedded, enacted, extended, but also ecological. And um, we are or it is argued that cognition is an uh, embodied, embedded, enacted, extended, and ecological um, process uh, of sense making uh, through a body 
in an environment. So this is an evalu evaluative interaction of an organism and its environment. So in, in detail, these four or five E's mean that uh, um, body cognition is enabled through and also constrained by the non-neural body. Um, embedded means that cognition depends on the environment to context um, as the organism is situated within the environment. Um, enacted means that cognition is for action and depends on the interaction of the embodied organism with the environment. And extended means that cognition extends beyond the brain and body into the environment. The most notable example might be your smartphone. And lastly, ecological means that cognition depends on the environmental affordances for, for action. And altogether, this might con constitute a, a, an activism with a 5E perspective. So combining these perspectives of embodied and inactive uh, and activism, um, both mental and physical health conditions, for example, pain and depression, um, are associated with altered interaction, uh, with an altered interaction of the organism with, with, with the environment through its embodiment. So it's uh, the three-part interaction of brain, body, and environment. So to sum this up, uh, embodiment and an activism emphasize the interaction of brain, body, and environment in understanding the mind and cognition. And um, to understand the, the processes of the brain in a little bit more detail, we, we have to turn to another field of research, which is the next part of the background, which is predictive coding. And I believe that predictive coding is, is a topic most of the listeners are more familiar with than us, but I try to summarize them anyway. So predictive processing um, is a theoretical framework with uh, growing influence in, in the field of cognitive science. And uh, it is um, closely related, but also distant, uh, distinct from the free energy principle, Bayesian brain hypothesis and active inference. So I will summarize all of them closely, uh, shortly. So the free energy principle proposes that living systems resist a tendency to disorder or in other words, um, remain in thermodynamic non-equilibrium steady states. And they do so by restricting themselves to a limited number of states uh, through the minimization of free energy. And in, in this instance, free energy is defined as the difference between the system's predicted and actual states. And this can be minimized using both perception and action. In perception, it is minimized by updating the prediction uh, that is made from the generative model uh, based on the sensation. And action in turn um, is changing the sensation through action to match with the prediction. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And uh, the Bayesian brain hypothesis um, proposes that brains make uh, predictions about the causes of extraceptive, interoceptive, but also proprioceptive sensations um, using both the current sensory input but also prior beliefs based on the generative model. And in general, uh, the confidence or precision one has uh, in the belief or the prior um, and the sensory input or the likelihood um, will determine how much the perception will in the end shift towards the expectation. So um, in general, a gap between prior and likelihood is called a prediction error or free energy. And uh, while a system is Minimizing prediction error or free energy or surprise or entropy that is uh, also maximizing the uh, uh, evidence for its own model of the world. And this is uh, the Bayesian brain hypothesis is, is uh, relating to behavior. So predictive coding is putting this into a neural perspective and proposes that there are descending top-down predictions that are uh, conveyed from higher cortical levels down to lower cortical levels uh, where they are compared to um, us sending bottom-up sensory information. So uh, from this perspective, information only goes up the cortical hierarchy um, if a mismatch between the predicted and actual information occurs, which is termed a prediction error. And otherwise, uh, top-down predictions constantly explain away um, bottom-up sensory information. So um, then there is active appearance, which proposes that the brain actively modifies its input to confirm prior expectations. And this is an, an active and also selective sampling of sensory information in the world through action. So um, prediction errors can be minimized. We have talked about it uh, a little bit 
through perceptual inference and active inference. Uh, perceptual inference meaning, meaning revising the generative model based on the prediction errors and active inference um, acting on the world to, to generate uh, a state that is predicted by the generative model. And to bring all of this together uh, with the physical and mental health condition, uh, to understand the physical and mental health conditions, um, it might be an altered weighting of prior beliefs and sensory information, which uh, gives rise to physical and mental health conditions. So, for example, physical health conditions, uh, uh, prior beliefs are likely overweighted relative to sensory information, which means I follow too much prediction, uh, precision, um, which then predicts symptoms that are consequently experienced. And um, this might also lead to heightened um, prediction of pain even towards harmless sensations, so that harmless sensations might be perceived as painful. And uh, on the other hand, mental health conditions, um, both uh, prior beliefs might be overly precise compar in comparison to sensory information or vice versa. Um, so the first one in depression and the, the second one in psychosis. And yes, uh, so one point that was uh, quite um, interesting is that chronic pain and depression, which we are quite interested in, uh, are particularly linked to false experiences of interoception. There's a little literature about this. So that's, this is our next uh, research topic that we want to uh, to combine with the other ones. Um, so what is interoception? Um, Kaiser et al. Uh, have defined interoception as uh, the process by which the nervous system senses, uh, interprets, and integrates signals originating from within the body. So it's all information from within our own body. And this provides uh, some kind of embodied sensory experience. Um, which is absolutely necessary for the adaptive interaction with the environment. So um, an interesting aspect is that um, the active inference model was also applied to interoception, which is termed um, interoceptive inference. And it proposes that interoceptive experiences re result from inferences about the hidden causes of this sensory information. So to put this um, into the neural perspective, uh, top-down interoceptive predictions are compared with bottom-up intercept, interceptive information, most likely in the insula, and the mismatch between both then results in uh, prediction error, which uh, is minimized depending on the uh, on the uh, precision by either perceptual inference or active inference. So perceptual inference means revising the top-down interceptive predictions, and active inference means then modifying the bottom-up interceptive information to convey with a prediction. And uh, interestingly, uh, Andrew Seth has proposed that uh, an emotion can also be view viewed as interoceptive inference because interoceptive prediction errors are used to infer emotional states. So to uh, connect this to physical and mental health conditions, um, deficits in interoceptive processing, for example, uh, low interoceptive accuracy, um, might be associated with both physical and mental health conditions like chronic pain and uh, comorbid depression. Um, however, there uh, is, um, it is not clear uh, how that every disorder or in every individual uh, might behave the same in this way. I think there are, there are uh, uh, differences. So, um, so some disorders and individuals would likely benefit from reducing overly uh, precise interoceptive predictions. Uh, for example, worrying beliefs about real but in, indeed harmless sensations, uh, while other patients might might uh, reduce overly precise interoceptive information, which is, uh, for example, illusory sensations that are maintain that maintain worrying beliefs. So um, there are both possibilities. So let's talk about our approach on uh, how to influence uh, to uh, interoceptive information. And this is osteopathy. We are all osteopaths, uh, the authors on this paper. So a few words about osteopathy. Osteopathy combines uh, hands-on manual approaches with um, hands-off patient management approaches. So we use touch and manipulation as hands-on, uh, which is informed by osteopathic models of care. So our clinical reasoning. And hands-off patient-managed approaches involve uh, patient education, psychological support, lifestyle advice, but also um, self-management solutions. And these are um, informed, of course, by osteopathic principles.
but notably both um, might utilize uh, top-down and bottom-up dynamics between peripheral tissues and the brain. Um, yes, so in general, osteopathy is applied to treat uh, a range of clinical conditions, uh, but uh, an emphasis is, is given on chronic pain conditions and in particular musculoskeletal disorders like back pain. And uh, philosophically, osteopathy uh, has emphasized the, the unity and interaction of, of body, mind, and soul for, for quite some time. And uh, it has also been proposed that um, it might benefit psychological outcomes, especially in chronic pain patients, but this uh, needs some further research. And um, uh, Francesco and colleagues also proposed that uh, osteopathic treatment might uh, influence interoceptive processing in, in a concept paper they published in, I think, 2016 and uh, went on to, to conduct some primary research showing that um, osteopathy indeed uh, increases interoceptive accuracy, but also decreases uh, the bold response uh, of brain correlates of interoception in patients with uh, chronic low back pain. So um, they do so probably by uh, the stimulation of afferent C tactile fibers, which communicate interoceptive and, and affective dimensions of touch. So this could be relevant to both physical and mental health conditions that involve interoceptive deficits, which are, for example, chronic pain and also depression. So this is our background, and I think it leads up to, to the framework we like to present. And the framework bridges all of these uh, fields of research. And it is an embodied interoceptive, uh, but also predictive framework. And um, the basic basis is that both physical and mental uh, health symptoms may result from ultra precision weighting between interceptive predictions and interceptive input. So we argue that, uh, or the literature argues that um, either too much precision is further to the prior, which is an overly precise prediction, on, um, or too little precision is further to the likelihood, which is an imprecise prediction error. So um, arguably, Chronic pain and depression um, are mainly linked to the overweighting of priors. So um, these beliefs likely predict painful and depressive states, even if the actual interceptive information is harmless. Um, and they do so due to past experiences. And they likely make these states come true through active inference. So the expected symptoms might be gener generated through action to confirm the prediction and in, in order to update these prior beliefs and reduce the active inference of, of pain and, and um, depressive states, it is likely that surprising interoceptive input needs to be provided um, to increase, first of all, the, the weight of the likelihood, but also to, to generate prediction errors that can revise the belief, issuing the predictions, and thus osteopaths uh, likely need to foster perceptual inference. So actual information is used in perceptual inference to, to update the prediction and also the perception of these symptoms. And we have a look at figure two in a moment. So um, this uh, there's a paper by Farb uh, from 2015, which, which had argued that uh, contemplative practices may alter interoceptive processing by shifting regulatory habits from active to perceptual inference. And uh, I be uh, we believe that, that osteopathy does uh, the same. So, if we have a look at our main figure here, um, we propose that uh, you see a patient in, in red lying on the treatment table. Uh, imagine this patient has um, a chronic pain with a comorbid depression, and he's lying there, and the osteopath provides some touch based interventions uh, to the symptomatic area. In this, uh, uh, this image, the abdomen. And we argue that. The belief or the prior of the patient um, is likely to predict physical and mental states that are associated with pain and depression because uh, to be the likely, likely cause of uncertain information. And this is uh, the, the overweighting of the prior. But uh, if we provide some treatment interventions to the patient, uh, the sensory input is not linked to these physical and mental states, um, which is surprising. Uh, but osteopathic treatment often does not involve pain, but is quite pleasant if you, if you touch a patient. So this is a surprising mismatch, of course, to the, patients, uh, to the patient because the expected and the actual information do not match and uh, thus uh, generate an interceptive prediction error. So these prediction errors need to be minimized and they can be minimized using active or perceptual inference. 
And uh, in chronic pain, we argue that uh, high precision is afforded to the belief, to, to the prior, and low precision is afforded to the sensory information and the likelihood. So the first process that needs to be engaged is active inference, um, which likely produces uh, the symptoms uh, that are resembling the predicted states. So uh, likely the autonomic nervous system is engaged um, to produce sensations that uh, uh, resemble the uh, expected uh, painful and depressive uh, feeling. So, uh, however, we are in a healthcare context in osteopathic treatment, so the patient might also be declined, uh, declined to, uh, to think that this is a health promoting intervention. So, um, this is not, um, not, uh, um, this is contradictory with the, uh, with the prediction. So, um, it, active adherence might not be sufficiently to, to, um, reduce and explain the interceptive uh, prediction errors. So consequently, we argue that perceptual appearance processes might be engaged um, to update then the belief and the prior based on the likelihood. So the sensory information provided by the osteopath might update the belief uh, by the patient and th thereby revising the generative model, holding the belief and issuing the prediction. So um, we argue that these are the processes that underpin osteopathic treatment um, in these kind of patients and especially when an emotional reaction and, and treatment um, uh, develops. So, um, uh, yeah, and, and in essence, we argue that uh, belief and the prediction of physical and mental uh, states that are associated with pain and depression uh, are updated um, through um, these interventions. So the, the persistent and noisy interceptive predictions errors which maintain the symptoms through active interference uh, might be uh, replaced with surprising and precise interceptive prediction errors uh, to alleviate the symptoms through perceptual interference. So this is, uh, in a nutshell, our, our framework. And uh, we also, of course, need to discuss this framework and have a look at some implications, also limitations. So in general, I'd like to uh, emphasize that uh, this theoretical framework is a theoretical framework and therefore requires experimental scrutiny for verification or falsification. So future research uh, particularly needs to explore if osteopathic treatment indeed um, uh, alleviates physical and mental symptoms in this patient population. Also, if it actually increases interoceptive accuracy in this population and likely also decreases allostatic load and modulates autonomic nervous system activity. So there are a few measurement tools we can use for that. And um, other limitations uh, include um, the disregard of complexity, both of the health conditions, but also of the therapeutic approaches. So osteopathy and mental uh, and depression and, uh, and chronic pain are all very complex conditions and we have simplified them like, extremely. So we overlooked environmental factors and we didn't um, uh, go into uh, explaining the patient therapist relationship uh, in detail as well. But uh, this framework should be understood in this context. So it should be understood in the person-centered context. And uh, future studies might um, also uh, um, have a look at why manual treatment of peripheral tissues sometimes leads to autonomic and emotional uh, responses. And I think this is the basic of why I was so interested in, in this research and these theories, because in practice, I've all I've frequently engaged patients uh, which responded quite emotionally to touch and um, felt quite better after. So I wanted to, to understand how this might happen. So based on our hypothesis, you can see in, in figure uh, three, uh, panel A, that um, the therapeutic input uh, that is um, provided during treatment may contradict the predicted state of pain and depression and produce an interoceptive prediction error, uh, which is used to inferior emotional states and need to be minimized by active inference or by perceptual inference. And what you can see in panel A is that the initial active inference is quite uh, quick and sharp. And uh, we have seen, or I've seen, uh, and my colleagues as well from experience, that often if patients uh, display emotional responses to treatment, uh, they firstly experience some sympathetic activity like sweating and muscle tightness combined with uh, emotional distress, for example, uh, starting to cry. But uh, these uh, initial reactions uh, frequently uh, uh, are replaced with uh, very uh, parasympathetic activity. So the breathing goes down and the patient 
uh, starts to relax and emotional calmness uh, starts to set in. And uh, I believe this is quite well explainable with the uh, framework we have provided here because uh, an active inference might be the first way to engage uh, uh, in minimizing these prediction errors and perceptual inference might be the second and more sustainable way of uh, minimizing these prediction errors. So uh, lastly, you can see on, on panel B, uh, another I idea which might come from this framework. And this is the ground for multidisciplinary collaborations in the treatment of mental and physical uh, uh, disorders. So we propose a kind of uh, integrative interoceptive exposure therapy in, in which uh, both um, physical but also mental health care specialists can come together and um, um, work in a multidisciplinary but also person-centered care approach. And the idea is, if you can see on, on the left-hand side here, is that mindfulness uh, practices likely work top-down, uh, helping the patient to attend to the sensation that he or she is experiencing, um, but also uh, affecting the sensory information, like osteopathy working bottom-up, also um, affecting the sensory information by likely producing a, sen a sensation itself. And uh, psychotherapy is, is likely to work top-down. Um, to help uh, identify and um, also uh, reflect on the sensation and likely works on uh, um, works on the prior on the belief uh, directly and not through the sensory information. So um, these are a few few uh, future research ideas. And now we can conclude uh, this presentation. And uh, to put it all together, um, this hypothesis and theory article um, proposes the embodied predictive and interest of the framework, uh, and it does so to reason and research the effect of osteopathic treatment um, as potatively on comorbid psychological factors in patients with persistent uh, physical conditions. And um, one of the basic ideas is that persistent physical and mental conditions like chronic pain and depression um, uh, may be underlined by first overly precise interoceptive predictions, meaning that um, uh, the symptom congruent information is expected, uh, and second, imprecise interoceptive prediction errors, meaning that uh, symptom incongruent information is, is not sensed. So osteopathic treatment may provide um, uncertain and surprising interoceptive information to the bodily area that is associated with the physical and also comorbid uh, mental symptoms resulting in interoceptive prediction errors that first engage active interference processes, uh, which lead to initial autonomic activity resembling the predicted symptoms. And this is uh, because it is the most likely cause of uncertain interceptive information due to the past experiences of the patient. And uh, afterwards, due to the contextual factors, uh, the patient likely engages perceptual interference processes that then update the maladaptive interceptive predictions based on uh, the actual interceptive information. And osteopathy might also um, actually improve the ability to attend to actual uh, interceptive information. So in a nutshell, persistent and noisy interceptive prediction errors that maintain the symptoms are likely replaced with surprising and precise interceptive prediction errors that um, arguably alleviate the symptoms. And in this way, uh, treatment might reduce the belief about and also the prediction of physical and mental states that are associated with chronic pain and comorbid depression. And uh, we are currently also at the Osteopathic Research Institute conducting uh, research into uh, these approaches. So uh, Torsten, who has also joined us today, um, has developed uh, uh, an approach to psychosomatic osteopathy. And we are currently having a look on how these techniques might influence stress levels in healthy participants, but also patients with chronic tension type headaches so chronic musculoskeletal disorders so maybe there's uh, some things to follow in the future so that's it thank you very much uh, for your attention uh, i'm really looking forward to the discussion and to engaging uh, robert george and francesco um, and here are the references i think i scrolled through them shortly and if someone is interested i think they can get the presentation is that right daniel yes so oh, that's it thanks lucas that was an awesome presentation really a lot to think and talk about so perhaps we'll first just open it up to 
any of the authors and colleagues here. Please just uh, jump in wherever you'd like. I think it'd be awesome to hear about just your overview or what brought you to this area of research, as well as anything that you picked up on from this last presentation. I think maybe I can say a few words because I forgot something in the beginning. So um, it, it all started with, with George and Francesco um, inviting inviting uh, Robert and me to, to join a research group that um, tries to, to reconceptualize osteopathic care under the active inference framework. So um, we have a, a group of osteopaths from Europe um, working with the active inference framework. And uh, there are also other papers uh, coming uh, in a special topic which is also uh, has been uh, edited by edited by uh, George and Francesco. So there's uh, there are other these coming forward in the near future. Uh, I think you know one one thing that um, I guess brought us into this area. You know, is is a sort of a, a way of looking into how we can best. Um, help our patients, in particular those with, um, you know, present with complexity, um, including, you know, chronic pain, but not just chronic pain, uh, you know, the, the broad sort of uh, area of persistent physical symptoms, you know, those that tend to sort of um, go around, see different practitioners, um, look for a solution to their problem, try to know what's going on. And, you know, we tend to sort of see them in practice and struggle at times if we use, um, you know, a, a very reductionist approach to practice, which is do a manual intervention and hope for the best. You know, that's that's far from, um, you know, from what is best practice these days, what is patient-centered care. And also, um, Can you still hear? John? I just lost George for an audio. I was just going to ask. Yeah, me too. Okay. I, I can pick up a bit from that. Um, there's been a kind of a problem with, a, with osteopathic theory over the years, um, which George is um, hinting at around the reductionistic sort of bio, um, biomechanical model. And when it comes to complexity, those sorts of traditional ways of looking at people's chronic symptoms um, leave something to be, um, well, they, they, they're, they're, they're not really, um, they leave things missing. We, we're realising using, uh, if we draw from other disciplines, that we can see that there's a um, potentially much better way to describe why people have these kind of chronic type symptoms and um i i came into this a bit like uh, lucas with um being quite surprised in practice about how people react to treatment and i think we have this um it's almost a kind of a tacit uh, sort of thing within the profession that we we treat people with emotional disturbance but we don't actually upfront it and so this conceptual framework is actually starting to redress the balance, um, which I think is really, really important. And trying to understand why is it people react? Um, I think the, this notion of prediction errors is um, kind of an interesting one. I, I came into it a long time ago, looking at it from a psychodynamic point of view and things called ab reactions. But I think what we're moving towards is trying to come up with a bit more of a unified theory. And that's why I think the concepts of active inference and, and activism are actually starting to help. And also add the participatory sense making uh, movement also adds a lot to how we can start to understand it. Uh, I know Lucas mentioned we haven't talked about the therapeutic relationship, but we are, there are other papers in the pipeline that will look at. I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> I hope that sort of did a bit of a summary for you, George. I mean... Very interesting. Yes. Framing. Uh, yeah, Thank continue, you. George. No, no, no. I, I think Robert, 
you know, did a brilliant job in uh, summarizing everything. So, you know, all the challenges and the reasons why, you know, we we got inter interested in into exploring a different kind of way of of looking at things. Francesca or Torsten, would you like to add anything? Um, <coughs> otherwise, anyone in the uh, live chat is welcome to add a question, and I have some questions too. Uh, yes, Daniel. So um, one other um, viewpoint that I can add at this point is that from previous research that actually we published looking at the, uh, and using fMRI, but also other uh, neurosci neuroscientific tools like, for example, thermocams, um, we ended up understanding or exploring the fact that actually the brain is starting to react to specific or general touch in a kind of uh, similar but different way. So, and this actually creates a kind of a, a question, a research question on where the uh, ability of a specific manual therapies approach might intercede with uh, specific brain, spe uh, bottom up or top down uh, in an, an old style way describing the, how the brain works. Because actually now we know and look in particular in the in activism that uh, an, an active inference, the, the, uh, the brain actually doesn't work without the, with a top down or bottom up, uh, bottom up stream so far. But in a, in a way, we actually, we ended up saying that probably uh, the interaction with the body, so using a kind of uh, affordancing and sense-making, so creating action into the, the, uh, uh, into the patient and through the action of the, uh, the therapeutic alliance and therefore through the, uh, the uh, professional, and the operator might create a kind of uh, a sharing uh, um, scenario or a sharing environment that when with the uh, with the uh, concept of uh, predictive processing and active inference might also be explained through the Markov blankets communication and Markov blankets connection between the uh, the the two uh, the two elements. Uh, so the patient and the operator, that some, something might happen not only through the specific activity that any type of manual therapist can do, but also in within a framework of uh, closeness between the, um, the, the two uh, the two elements. Indeed, one of the, of the early studies that also Lucas mentioned, what actually we did was just touching the, uh, the ankles of a um, 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 healthy patient lay down on the scan, and we just change our uh, mental attitude on focusing towards the hand or avoiding the attention towards the hand. So like mimicking the way in which a, um, a manual therapist was uh, paying attention to what he or she is doing through manual manual touch or just being absolutely uh, away from the attention of the manuals and therefore in the specific elements of the uh, of the of the research was just counting a random bit bit uh, through the through the headphones so and what actually we uh, we saw is that in in those people that were touched uh, through an attention towards the hand, there, there was a higher activation of the insula and the infrafrontal gyrus. Like in a way, the, the, uh, the perception of the patient is, uh, is before the fact that actually is conscious of something happening from an interoceptive point of view within the body. So, and the body is saying, do you know what? I'm feeling something that actually I'm processing through an interoceptive framework in the, in the insula. And at the same time, I'm changing my um, uh, endos endogenous or exogenous attention based on the way in which you touch me. So, and therefore this creates a more complex environment in which actually we, we, we would like to understand better. And we think that in the, an active uh, approach is one of the, uh, with all its, let's say, subsections and elements that might be an inter interesting way of 
interpreting or at least trying to read what is happening in the complex clinical environment. Thank you. So I'll make an observation and then ask a question. So Robert, I really liked what you said about uh, being motivated from earlier on by what you saw the outcomes of treatment were. And then that was kind of alluded to in what we just heard, like um, you could be touching someone's ankle, but it's not just the ankle that might change. Maybe it's their knee, but maybe it's something in their head, but then maybe it's something in their organ or their brain or their mind. And um, that idea of like entering at the anomaly is it's very clinical. Like I'm not, that kind of a doctor, but that's kind of what I understand to be done, like looking for patterns and anomalies. And then it's also very at home in the realm of participatory sense making, like you also addressed, but also that's kind of active inference, which is relative to a generative model of the world. Mm -hmm. Observations are either consistent or surprising in some way. And so mm -hmm. that was just kind of, it's an interesting tie in. And I think it just speaks to how even in a qualitative or just a conceptual level across different domains, we can like talk about active inference as well as other areas and their concordances. And it's not like one has to nest over the other, their different mm -hmm. domains and um, approaches. So um, Robert, any thoughts on that or I have other questions? Yeah, I think um, th th there needs to be some, some kind of addressing of, um you, you got to you know you, you have a relationship between the practitioner and the patient and i think the participatory sense making can start to somehow dissolve a little bit of the the kind of the normative language which has become problematic so so anomalies in the past have been dismissed as in oh you're not getting better because you're not uh, uh, reacting to the treatment properly. Whereas these types of approaches are saying, oh, hang on a minute, there is a shared narrative. And I think the narrative medicine movement is also quite important in, in these ideas. Obviously, we can't write about that as well. Um, but it's, 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 it's nice, I think you've picked up on that sort of uh, multidimensional and crossover between different disciplines because i think that's another thing we're trying to make a big point of in this paper we need to reach out to other disciplines and say look we have this way of doing things but we know we're not we don't have the whole picture at all but if we can combine um, with psychologists psychiatrists uh, i mean all of all of us on the paper we've all gone outside of osteopathy to to look at other disciplines um, and the kind of, that's the kind of another kind of it's like a meta kind of participatory sense making that goes into, I think, what we're trying to achieve here. Like someone will look at that figure, and you all are saying, "Hey, we're the person above the table with the hands on and mm -hmm. with medical training." But then there's another part that you didn't go into detail on. What would be that therapy component or the niche modification component? So totally agree that the paper is like an invitation. And that was really um, to my question, like we see in other domains and applications of active inference, you reframe something that might have been perceived about like um, just reward or uh, a normative precision based approach. Like this is the reference range. And this you're getting your objective function is to enter that reference range. And it's like a red flag if it's not um, towards this more perhaps even customized uh, reduction of uncertainty um, and the body like predicting its own sensation. So I just wondered what are the implications? Does that play a role in how the medical expert understands the scenario? Does it play a role in the patient's own understanding of what's happening? Just how beyond the research predictions and experiments that are being described, how does this translate into a um, clinical experience? 
So one of the things uh, it, it's quite interesting you bringing the you know the concept of niche construction um, on the other paper that we have in the pipeline where we explore we actually argue that osteo osteopathic care is a kind of a active inference uh, you know there's an argument around you know the construction of you know a niche uh, which uh, can be a dyad uh, in the case in most adult interactions in clinical practice but it can also go beyond that and be even a triadic kind of relationship for example when you're treating uh, a baby where it actually is not a two-way communication uh, between the practitioner and the baby but it's also with the with the parents with, with the mother and and in fact you know the first person you need to bring you need to synchronize is probably with the mother as well because you know if you if you kind of treat the baby indirectly you get there so i think that there's a lot of sort of alignment there's a lot of synchrony um to take into account into the therapeutic encounter and you know arguably the the, the kind of the development of a robust uh, therapeutic alliance is through that when the two people sort of sharing uh, sharing a common niche but also sharing a you know common kind of uh, you know mental states and predicting uh, in a lot of times without any words uh, what the response of the other person is is likely to be so it could be uh, for some people may sort of sound a little bit uh, more kind of esoteric but if we put it through a lens of you know active inference in activism and so on sense making uh, you talking about things that are pre-reflective uh, you're talking about things that's just happened and uh, when um, even down the realms of at times we hear practitioners or our own experiences practitioners on, on kind of body work then you feel like at times that uh, you know the patient is, seems to be relaxing because you got some relaxation through your own kind of uh, body and it's a sort of it could be the esoteric side of things but also you could think that maybe that show uh, that demonstrates some form of alignment maybe that demonstrates uh, an element of synchrony uh, that can be done at sort of a more physiological level so there's a lot of um you know there's a lot of mileage uh, in, in in my opinion and in exploring clinical practice uh, particular in particularly in, in in situations of with an element of of complexity to explore it through them you know these lenses Yeah and, also, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, and also, yeah, uh, and also, this is also in line with the um, the most recent theoretical paper just published a few a few months ago by um, Antonio Damasio and and uh, colleagues, uh, where actually they, they were looking at the uh, complexity through the uh, um, the interoceptive nervous system. So what actually they called for the first time ever, no uh, interoceptive nervous system. So it's a system that includes not only the fact that actually uh, we need to understand what it's going in um, within our body. So the old concept between quotes, the old concept of Craig. So how do you feel? But it also goes into the, the fact that the body actually interacts with the environment and also uh, the uh, that uh, beautiful issue on uh, neuro or neuroscience uh, based on uh, uh, interoception, where actually they try to predict to uh, say something new in in terms of uh, interoception, where the uh, the the main hypothesis was that uh, the the way in which we create interoception that is a, the base for a complex clinical condition is not only related to the fact that the different brain areas and therefore the interoceptive ner uh, nervous system is creating a kind of interaction between all the autonomic and non-autonomic uh, areas, but also those areas are important for, um, for decoding what is happening outside the body and therefore through a sand, through a descending a primary and secondary descending mechanism that actually they in, introduce new variables within uh, within the system that uh, it allows the system to detect and to understand better the complexity 
and through this complexity create the uh, appropriate changes that might be help, uh, helpful for um, keeping the uh, non-equilibrium steady state and therefore all the concept in relation to the predictive cause, predictive cause. So what is the, uh, how we, we can intercede with that? Because actually we are using one element that is touch that in a way might be disturbing the system because actually it's using in particular gentle touch or what is called affective touch is disturbing or interacting with the system and just through those uh, anatomical uh, functional pathways that actually goes directly to the insula and so through the CT fibers and therefore we are interacting uh, in an ascending way uh, with that specific areas that are including the um, interoceptive nervous system that actual, actually are the, the one of the parts for emerging the, uh, the elements that we are talking about now. And why it's important as just to underline what Joe said, which uh, uh, I found very clever and I support that. So it's a way of creating a sort of uh, entry point that uh, also in the complex system might uh, intercede with something that is um, multifactorial within the, well, within the body that not only includes, for example, pain, the perception of pain and the experience of pain and all the elements that are inside the body, but also it creates the, the bound with something that is external. And bounding with external, it means that actually you are establishing uh, the therapeutic alliance in terms of the uh, dyadic, but also indirectly the triadic uh, condition when actually you treat, for example, a baby or an early D person. So when actually there is someone that might be a parent, that might be a, the son, the daughter, or legal guardian actually are bringing the, uh, uh, that person into, into the clinical encounter and therefore are part of the, uh, the general uh, treatment uh, session. So I think it's a, it's a way by, by looking at the neuroscience behind that, uh, the, theoretical, the theoretical framework and the practical examples that are clinically found, can be clinically found, it can, can be clinically explored. I think there is a, ni a nice way also to um, uh, intercede with, the, uh, with a, a different lens uh, to understand complex situations. I would add something to... Yes, please, Torsten. Okay, I would add something to um, what was said by Jerry Telly and uh, by, by Shosh and um, was that uh, I, I would even go a step further. I mean, we decided to support uh, Luca's work financially because it is part of the psychosomatic ospati in our point of view. But it's not only uh, that we want to interact our palpation in reaction to interception, but also to body sensations, to arousals, to emotions, to belief systems. And from my point of view, in this case, the osteopath is less a therapist, but more a co-regulator by the interaction between both of them, the awareness of the patient to his own stimulus in different levels will increase. And secondly, uh, from the beginning, osteopathy was interested in interrelationships. And this means that we are already in our own profession in a way interdisciplinary. So it means, for example, that also we could look that uh, peripheral hyperglycemia will lead always to a central hypoglycemia, uh, to a central uh, uh, glucopenia even. So it means you have no more sugar in your brain. So even if you would touch and you do all your psychological stuff, but by your metabolic system, you create a hypoglycemia in your brain, even then, whatever you do, it will not have a big result. So as more fragmented areas in the functioning of the patient's health, we can include in our treatment. And this means basically, which was in the past, not so much dominant and more active patient, uh, because in research, it was show proactivity is one of the most factors to be healthy and uh, basically in an, an osteopathic treatment, 
the patient is laying passively most of the time in the past. So here we have not only looking in research how osteopathic treatment can help, but even change osteopathic treatment in a more uh, postmodern way so that we can help the patient even more with our hands instead what was past treatments done in osteopathic treatment before. So actually on that theme of kind of origins and futures of osteopathy, I'll read a comment from the live chat and anyone else can write a chat too. Um, Good morning, my dear osteopathic brothers and sisters. I'm an American osteopath and must leave for work now, but wanted to share a history of the Still Hildreth Hospital in Kirksville, which was an outgrowth of Dr. Still's original concept, wishing to have osteopathic applications to mental health. There are still papers, papers by Still, which came out of that institution about effects osteopathy had on mental health conditions and early research on osteopathy and mental health from Mel Friedman, who is actually my father. So um, any thoughts on that? And also just keeping in mind the guest stream is kind of a two-way street. People in active inference who are perhaps hearing about osteopathy for the first time and vice versa. Just what are some of those principles, Lucas, that you mentioned in your presentation informed by osteopathic principles? Like what are some of those principles and origins and how has it changed? Because it was very interesting what Torsten had addressed. Yeah, so I think an important distinction that we have to make is between uh, American osteopaths and osteopaths uh, mostly around the world, because um, I, for myself, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor. So in, in, in the US, um, uh, the, o, uh, the DO is, is a medical doctor uh, in osteopathic, uh, in the osteopathic field. So they are, um, they can treat mental health conditions and psychiatric disorders, uh, and it is regulated that they can do this. So in Germany, for example, um, I can't treat someone with a major depression because uh, my training was not oriented to allow me to treat that. So uh, it is important for us to, to emphasize that we are um, not treating mental disorders on, on our own, but that we um, try to um, um, address uh, psychological factors in people with uh, physical conditions that are visiting us quite frequently. So I think that that is an, an early distinction that I have to make uh, between our colleagues uh, from America and uh, then to the point of, of the history of osteopathy. Uh, we came across a few papers um, that have argued for an osteopathic psychiatry. I think uh, that was uh, involved in this paper a little bit in the earlier times. And um, uh, there has been some work done, but uh, the work is, as uh, your father had, has outlined, quite old. So uh, we, we try to put some new perspectives uh, to this discussion, I think. That, uh, it's not a good I think uh, one thing, if I may, uh, would be useful to, to add is, you know, the origins of osteopathy with Andrew Taylor Still and, and some of you know, his early uh, students, including um, John Martin, Little John, were uh, were primarily based around, you know, new concepts, um, you know, concepts of, you know, uh, sort of um, unity, self-regulation that were kind of uh, relatively new in the late 19th century. And, and a lot of the work was sort of one, one interesting and important concept of concept of adaptation. So, you know, enabling people to adapt to, uh, to their day-to-day -day activities, to, to adapt and interact with the environment. Unfortunately, that was a little bit lost, uh, lost over the years, and and osteopathy and other forms of manual therapy, like chiropractic or uh, musculoskeletal physiotherapy, became for a long time based on a kind of very biomechanical model of care. You know, looking primarily at the as structure, the musculoskeletal structure, the reason for uh, quite a, quite a lot of the of, of the clinical problems. Which is, you know, in fact, led to um, Hoover, an American osteopath, in 19, 1963, to to write a very important paper that not many people actually read uh, or actually acted on, which actually called for osteopathy or osteopathic medicine to be ecological medicine, because you know it's not about just the theology; it's not about sort of using a pure biomechanical biomedical model and try to find. Uh, what is the cause of the problem? What is the pathology? 
So I think, you know, the interesting thing over the years, and actually that's, um, you know, something that actually, um, you know, personally attracted me a lot to, this, um, to these new ideas, uh, is, is actually these ideas uh, kind of are, are very much, you know, in, in a sense, aligned with those initial ideas of osteopathy, where everything kind of started from. Concept of this sort of adaptation, a central concept around the free energy principle, for example, the interactions with the environment, central con concepts around inactivism. So really to think about the person in that sort of unique ecological niche and how can we as practitioners uh, kind of help that person to, you know, help with, with self-regulation, etc. Also taking into account the knowledge we have these days about what is actually the role of the nervous system, pretty much about, you know, in the role of allostasis, for example, uh, not so much about the sort of the high order cognitive stuff. So, so I think there's there's a lot to extract from you know these frameworks and and not necessarily try to rewrite the history of osteopathy or other forms of manual therapy but actually apply things in a in a kind of a critical and you know serious manner to actually sort of move forward and move away from uh, you know from sort of uh, you know ideas that actually no longer make that much sense from for example you know, practicing entirely on a biomechanical model of, of you know, of care. Yeah. Right, I like very much what George was saying. And basically, it was not only Hoover, it was already little John and McConnell who gone in this way what Hoover explored more, and we are on the way of them, basically. So if we nowadays look also into genetics, which was in the beginning of osteopathy not possible, look into epigenetics, look into un, uh, lifestyle factors. And with each factor, the susceptibility of a person to get sick or get health increases. And if we include this with our palpation, we are on the way of little John McConnell and who were, was opened up for us already in the very early times of osteopathy. Thank you, Torsten. Robert, and then anyone else? Yeah, I just uh, don't want to lose sight of the fact that the paper is about recognizing that even though we may not be trained to deal with psychological interventions, an awful lot of our patients have psychological um, problems of some order or another. I think something like 40% of primary care consultations coexist with mental dis disturbance so whether we like it or not we're dealing with it and this is a this is a way we can go we're not training people we're not saying osteopaths should become psycho psychotherapists or psychologists but we're saying if we raise awareness of these issues it's going to help in our patient care and I agree very much what Robert was saying. And even I would go a step further. We can't avoid to interchange with emotional being, with the ANS being, with cognitive levels of a person. We only can be a little bit more competent when we treat with our palpation in these areas. And this doesn't mean that we need to be a psychotherapist in treating patients. It's the complex systems perspective that the entity is in the niche and that the mind and body are uh, interrelated, inseparable. And so any model that for some sort of like um, credentialing reason chooses to ignore that is going to be operating in peril. So how do we recognize the system's complexity, but also the immen uh, immense amount of information? You know, you could study just the liver and there would be a lot to learn or just the lungs. So how do we pull back and actually have a healthy relationship in this very complex setting? So here's a sort of um, fun question, also staying with the anomaly theme. I was wondering if throughout your training or experiences had come across any embodied exercises that you think are really good entry points to the predictive body and interoception. So like I was thinking of having one's arms in the door frame and trying to raise them out. And then when you step out, you know, the arms will raise. And um, I was wondering if there was any other experiences that might be that anomaly for someone to start wondering if they were 
interested to look into more of these approaches that you outline in the paper rather than the signal processing perception framework or some other um, non or pre act inf model. So I, I think the literature is quite dense with examples on, on how the, the body influences the mind in these kind of instances. Um, for example, going back to, to Strzok, uh, who published the study with the pen in between the teeth, uh, showing that people uh, find comics much more funnier if they had a pen between the teeth, because this pen activates uh, the zygomaticus ma major with this, uh, the primary muscle of, of laughing. So um, there are quite a few examples on uh, how simple manipulations of the body framework uh, influences uh, cognition and emotion. Um, but uh, I don't have some specific uh, exercises uh, to, to give to patients um, if that answers the question. Yeah. Well, because also, Daniel, I think it depends from the patient's condition so far. So if we take into account what we, what we said up to now, so it means that uh, each, pa uh, each patient has got its, uh, his or her own uh, clinical specific condition. So and, uh, going into a protocolized, for example, uh, exercise might end up with patient having different reactions. So, and therefore the, uh, the use of uh, these framework that consider the complexity of the patient uh, within a, the uniqueness of, uh, of him or of hair, definitely might uh, help us to be, uh, to have fantasy or to have imagination during the, uh, during the, uh, during the, the treatment and adapt the different possibilities that might be exercise and might be uh, treatment procedures and might be techniques and might be approaches into the condition of the patient that is not only the patient, but is the, the patient within the environment, within his or her environment, and therefore create the optimal way of what we predict that might be optimal for, uh, for the patient in order to achieve the, uh, the outcome that was, um, uh, that needs to be obtained, obtained. I think there's, um, in fact, you know, I'm just thinking one exercise that I, I tend to use, and it's nothing that I developed myself, but is used by quite a number of practitioners to, you know, sort of, to, to teach patients about pain and, and about the sensations they feel is, for example, to use the analogy to, um, you know, the, the sort of uh, a fist. So you, if you ask a patient, if, for example, in cases of patients with uh, chronic pain, fear of movement, you tend to find that, for example, movement tends to be quite slow and, and, and sort of restrictive, not so much because there's a serious limitation in the movement, but because there's a fear of movement. You tend to use, for example, ask the patient, look, and if you make a fist and you try to move your wrist, it's going to feel uncomfortable. And that's, in a sense, how, how your neck is trying to move against you resisting. If you sort of try to move relaxed, you know, it's, the sensations are completely different. So you can actually create, if you think about these exercises that are used by, you know, quite a lot of muscle skeletal practitioners to actually start introducing the, the sort of some some of the, the sensations that we want uh, that might actually violate their generative model and change things a little bit. So that's a good way of, you know, try to teach the patients, you know, this is how you should feel, this is how you should move and not so much like trying to move against resistance, which it happens if you make a fist and try to, you know, move your wrist. In general, I like very, very much also Francesco's um, commentary because in osteopathy we try really to identify uh, individualized approaches so there was a nice uh, research from Amy Cuddy where she changed body postures and measured the uh, cortisol and testosterone outcomes um, but in, uh, in, in, in new researches it was not confirmed because it was too it was not adapted to a certain person sometimes it's enough that just 
a slight extension in two vertebrates can give a person a different kind of breathing experience. In another person, it could be that just the face could be a little bit released in some muscles, like for example, uh, Lucas was mentioned. So I think the approaches to a patient in an osteopathic treatment is very individualized and it's not a general techniques for everybody which uh, could help so good as an individualized approaches in relation to different experiences. Thanks for all the awesome and diverse answers. So I'll ask the question um, carefully, I guess, but standardized interventions, whether they're measured in milligrams or educational curriculum, lend themselves towards being scientifically tested more easily, like a two group experiment, people who do or don't have the diagnosis, um, or any other number of situations. And it was really also just highlighted in what Torsten added with this uh, individuated experience and the dyad is unique. There's never going to be another one like that in the history of osteopathy with those people in that niche interacting that way. So just wondered um, what insights from all of your different areas of expertise start to help us address like the specificity of the particulars of an encounter, but also know what kinds of things should be available for population level use or on average, you know, are eggs good or bad? <laughs> Yeah, I think this is a, a really big problem in, in osteopathy um, and research, osteopathic research in general. Uh, is how, what kind of control groups uh, are we are we uh, doing? So if we if we are treating a patient, is is a mere touch without intention a good control group or no uh, intervention? So there are many problems to the to researching the person centered nature of osteopathy, but also the manual nature of osteopathy. And I think Francesco is, is a good person to speak about this because uh, he recently published a paper on control interventions in osteopathy. Maybe you want to add something, Francesco. Um, thanks, Lucas. So uh, I think the this is a very interesting um, question, uh, Daniel, um, for three reasons. So the first one is that we are uh, still within a, uh, a drug-based research uh, paradigm, because actually um, uh, during the from 1980s onward, the and then with the development of evidence-based medicine, the majority of the research actually was drug-based research, and therefore we can control milligrams, as you said, we can control the the type of ad, uh, administration and um, all the elements that actually created the randomized control trial, very controlled, very specific, and so on. However, uh, in during the last 10 years, uh, all this paradigm actually start to like have some creepy things. And in which sense? Because actually uh, it's, mm, it's very far away from the, um, from the clinical practice. And the clinical practice is based on variability. And the variable and outliers and the variability and outliers are important to understand what are the clinical effects of a specific treatment. So um, indeed, uh, during the last 15 years, this concept of having super rigid um, randomized control trial, in particular in the intervention group, and therefore in the control group, actually started to change or start to be molded in a way of creating something it's much more um much closer to the reality therefore they ended up with pra pragmatic clinical trial and pra pragmatic clinical trial are those trials actually are more uh, are closer to the reality in which there is not just one an administration in terms of for example drug treatment but actually they are taking into account all the different elements that might influence the effect of the treatment itself. Indeed, when actually we uh, administer 
administer, for example, a, 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 a drug, but then uh, we looking for long-term effects or long-term outcomes in the intervention group and the intervention group then goes back home and they are one group one part of this intervention group is very very happy because they just the uh, they just got in a new child uh, they just had a, uh, they just won the lottery and all the positive elements obviously the long-term effects of the, the drug treatment is definitely better than the uh, the uh, someone instead who, uh, for example, had a lost. So what is the the what is the concept underneath that? Is the concept of the the research is changing, and also the methodological elements underneath research are changing. Now there are pragmatic trials, but they're also what they call the benchmarking control trials. So there are actually are trials that are important uh, for detecting what is happening during the clinical uh, routine life within the hospital and then adding another intervention to the normal routine care, then you see what is the difference between the two pathways. So what it's saying by that, it's saying that it is true that it's important to control all the variables within a given intervention, but at the same time, if we look at the cause effect and therefore efficacy, yes, it's important. If we want to look at what is in, in, uh, instead it's called effectiveness, so the clinical effect of a specific treatment, then what you do, what you specifically do, a specific treatment or uh, 10, grams, 10 grams more or 15 grams left, actually it doesn't make so uh, that difference because of the what we are talking here and also because probably those 15 grams are uh, less are um, probably uh, will have more powerful effects if i'm talking to the patient with the right tone and therefore creating and uh, inducing an increased effect uh, based on the uh, uh, interaction, the narrative, the shared narratives that we are talking. So in a way, it's true, but at the same time, uh, the, uh, the recent evidence are shifting the, uh, the methodological research com concept towards complex intervention. Thank you for the awesome response. And indeed, it is mirroring trends in other scientific areas to study um, targeted perturbations and measuring dynamical systems after perturbation or testing different dynamical models rather than just summary statistic and t-test and then you know rubber stamp that so it is absolutely really um interesting um does anyone else have any uh comments or questions or yeah, things they'd like um, to share please robert <laughs> I mean, there's quite a tradition in the nursing world to look at action research, which is real life and real life uh, interventions. You know, what happens at the ground level? And I think that's really where we are. That's what we're saying. You know, what actually happens in the treatment room? Not what we think what happens, but actually what happens. And this is a conceptual framework that enables that. So almost within ACTIM, it'd be like the difference between what we think is going to happen. Like, well, if the two comparisons of the two different amounts had this effect on the biomarker, well, then the mm -hmm. one that had the better biomarker effect should be used in the clinic, right? And so that's mm -hmm. like staying within the generative model, but then always being open to having new information and being able to have um, discernment to know whether it's consistent or inconsistent with our expectations, but our expectations for complex systems, even people mm. we know very well, like they can still surprise mm. you. And so, um, but always keeping that openness to the, even the tactile, which is something that a lot of other medical modalities don't do. And so maybe mm. the tactile 5% of the time, it diverts a cohort of patients towards another diagnosis, like the tissue is warm, but that at the whole population level, wouldn't even be statistically significant, but mm. it might be very important for a small subset. So it's mm. very interesting about like kind of pointing without um, dwelling on some of the limitations of the current 
medical system, which I think most people can agree is uh, not realizing our preferences. And then here's actually a science informed way when we can start to look at complex interventions in human systems. Well, yeah, absolutely. And th therefore, there, there are still, they are starting, we are starting to have also some theories uh, behind that. Uh, that can be um, a complexity of living system that actually can be also applied into uh, this field, um, this changing view of the research field that up to now, as we said, was mainly based on, was biased towards the pharmace pharmaceutical uh, standpoint. Any other um, thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, this is a very big point Francesco is saying, and all his uh, his extremely engagement in uh, in helping us to get more science is incredibly important. Basically, to have a little bit balance, we will never have the full balance because with our treatment we can't make so much money like a pharma concern can do. Um, hmm. But at, at least uh, we have opportunities for uh, opening uh, doors in uh, in a way that is closer to reality and creating um, a, a way that up to now is the mainstream. Because actually also the um, uh, drug-based uh, treatment actually are uh, facing uh, big challenges up to now. Uh, and the more you go, either you go in uh, ultra precise medicine, because actually we are all going all the way down and deep into uh, precise medicine, or you need to go on the opposite side. In the middle, everything is already discovered. So uh, therefore, there, there are chances to integrate the two because there are chances, because actually we are living in a way that actually we need precise medicine. Uh, but at the same time, we need also um, complex intervention. We need complex way of looking uh, at the uh, at the um, um, at the person uh, in a different way, not in a sec super segmented way, uh, but in a way that actually it brings everything together. I think another piece of the puzzle was brought up um, when someone mentioned the early paper about osteopathic approaches as ecological medicine, because in my own research with insect ecology, that was always mm -hmm. the question. Well, you could have the mm -hmm. insects in the lab, and then you know what age they were and what they ate, but then the temperature and the humidity aren't what they have evolved to experience, and you don't know whether they're healthy, but then out in the wild, they're doing interesting stuff in the way that it's meant to happen but you don't know how old the animal is, or you don't know what its physiological condition is, or you don't get the measurements. And so there's a dialogue there between the more controlled laboratory side, which is like kind of precision medicine. I mean, some people may want to live in a laboratory if that means that they could make more measurements about their body. And then there's sort of the field ecology, natural history angle. Um, so, that's very um, interesting how there is like a medical along with a mental health and an ecological synthesis happening in a sense through osteopathy that now a lot of different perspectives are helping to combine um, typified in Lucas's very dense and informative slides. <laughs> well, ecological is one of the E's we mentioned. Yes. There are many E's. And like <laughs> maybe the term inactive might not come in. Also, Ashtavis, it's another E. Mm. Uh, okay. <laughs> Seven E, more E's. Um, but it, and also it shows how different um, ways of describing across fields can prevent their synthesis. Like again, osteopathy might not have used the term inactivism, but I mean, mm. looking back on it, isn't it, it's almost, it's, it's it's not even it's to say it's definitional is like an understatement. So then there's a lot of latent 
possibility and then how does that get applied and how does it um change the way that the art and the science are carried out are enacted themselves um if anyone else would like to ask a question or like what would you say to those who are learning active inference and just hearing about what you've described for the first time or those maybe from the medical or osteopathic community who are learning about active inference for the first time in sort of closing? I would say that um, active inference provides um, a way in, in which we can actually simplify things, you know, rather than making them more complex. I think there's a lot of, you know, people would feel scared. There's another model and there's another kind of complex thing to look into it. In fact, if you look at sort of the basic foundations of active inference, is, is actually things make perfect sense. And in fact, you can simplify uh, your interaction with your patient in and become a much more effective way. You know, it's a kind of a, you know, when you get to that point where you know that things are working well, since you know your internal states are my active states and, and vice versa, when I can predict things. So um, I think it can, can, um, can help us with that, can also help us to, um, to understand, uh, you know, complexity that patients bring to the table. And, you know, the paper is about mental health and osteopathy. And, you know, a lot of people would argue osteopathy is primarily based on focused on musculoskeletal care. But as we've been talking about, you know, most musculoskeletal care and the most musculoskeletal conditions have an element of mental health. Uh, in a sense, the patient that uh, can't get out, can't do their normal day to day activities when their world stops making sense is likely to become depressed. So if you, by working on their you know, musculoskeletal problem, make them feel better indirectly or even directly, you are treating their mental health condition. So, so it's, I think can can help us to see the, the bigger picture rather than simply the, the dysfunction in the body or the brain, in fact. I, I definitely echo that with George. And I think what I've learned and I've been working in this field for 30 years, is this is giving us a handle on some of the uncertainty that goes on as a practitioner. Um, a lot of my students get really scared about how to deal with unpredictable things that occur in practice. And it can be you know, pretty challenging because there's a lot of complexity. And I think the big take home message I'd say is you don't have to be the expert on your patient. This gives us a handle. Yeah, I mean, you have a hard enough time being an expert on yourself, but to be an expert on another human being is pretty damn difficult. This gives us a model framework. It, it's some way it's reinventing things that may other people have said in the past, but it's it's starting to bring it all together into a, a package that says, right, there's a ecological niche, or you could say shared narrative. There's a way of talking to a patient that you don't have to tell them what to do that we can kind of work out um we can facilitate healing and that actually is what initially got me into osteopathy i think this is a, a very interesting point robert uh, and i it, it resonates with uh, a thing that is uh, an osteopathic principle that we try to activate uh, the self-healing powers of patients. And this implies for me that we are not uh, the therapist who, who brings up healing in the patient, but the patient in, in itself um, is generating uh, the healing. And therefore, we are not the specialists who have to understand and the complexity of the patient, but to be there as a, as a counterpart and evolve with the patient to generate a more healthy uh, life. I can't help but remark on Robert, what you said there about not having to be an expert. Um, it reminded me of how like the arm 
doesn't have to be a, a theoretical coffee cup subject matter expert. It has to implement a strategy of which a broad range are going to be possible and none of them can be pre-stated, but it has to implement a strategy to get the coffee cup. And so it's just a very um, interesting way to tie together the transdisciplinarity with also one of the threads of an activism and ecological psychology and active inference, which is that we're doing and thinking and doing are together rather than waiting to be subject matters on experts on everything before we are able to act in a complex niche that includes us as a part, but we're not going to get the whole picture on. Well, this was a very fun discussion. It sounds like you all are on a very cool yep. line of research and we really appreciate it in the lab. I hope that you'll come back and discuss more as more research occurs. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very, very much. much. Right. Thanks a lot. Okay. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye.